Good afternoon. My name is Father Constantine. I'm the pastor of St. Elijah here. And we welcome you on behalf of my brothers, the priests, the Orthodox priests in the state of Oklahoma and their parishioners. And uh, we are very happy and blessed to have with us the speakers yesterday and today, the Archpriest Father James Bernstein and Matthew Gallatin and uh, John Maddock, uh, who is overseeing the Ancient Faith Radio as well as the Conciliar Press. He had to leave back to his home. Uh, just for your information, um, if you will kindly fill the uh, brochure, the questionnaires, and, and somebody will pick them up later on after the conclusion of uh, the lecture. Uh, you are more than welcome to visit our churches. Um, you can find their addresses, the names of the pastors, and the back of one of these brochures, so that you can visit and witness ancient services from the first century. Also, we do have with the lecture series, the mini lecture series, beginning next uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, just giving an opportunity to people to pick up one of their Evenings, there will be a book signing and there will be uh, refreshments following this lecture. This morning we had a wonderful turnout and last night and there will be one this evening. And uh, the one who will be introducing our speaker is uh, our deacon Israhim, who was a former Baptist minister and he has been with me for the past good 10, 12 years. So uh, Deacon Herb, please welcome. Our guest speaker. Thank you, Father. Well, good afternoon. I hope you've had a, a chance to have lunch, and uh, an enjoyable lunch and a relaxed lunch, and are now prepared to come and learn just a little more about this original Christianity. You know, we say that the Orthodox Church represents original Christianity, but we never say that it's the only place that God is or where the grace of God abides. All truth is God's truth. And as Orthodox Christians, we rejoice wherever that truth is being declared. We know and readily acknowledge and give thanks for the faithful and many faithful non-Orthodox Christians over the last 500 years or so that have truly loved Christ and have shared his gospel and have desired to serve him and have done so. What we are hoping to show you and to demonstrate to you and give you a taste of during these two days together and also in our mini course that will start next week as Father just said is a chance to see the fullness of the church as it has existed since the beginning and has been faithfully handed over and handed down over the last 2,000 years. And that is exactly what our next speaker is going to be addressing this afternoon the original Christian church. Uh, for those of you that were not here or with us last night, Father James Bernstein was raised in Queens, New York, by formerly Orthodox Jewish parents whose faith had been undermined by the Holocaust. Arnold Bernstein, now Father James, went on his own personal quest for the God that he instinctively felt was there. He was ready to accept that God in whatever form God chose to reveal himself, and that form turned out to be Christ. He soon perceived discrepancies in the over 25,000 forms of Protestant Christian belief that surrounded him, and so his quest after meeting Christ continued this time for the original church. With his Jewish heritage as a foundation, he studied and evaluated and eventually came to the conclusion that the faith of his forefathers was fully honored and brought to completion only in the Orthodox Christian Church, the original church. He tells his story in detail in his new book, uh, Surprised by Christ, and we have that at our book table in the Fellowship Hall. 
Uh, Father James will be available after our session here in the hall if you would like to get a copy of that book. He'll be signing them and you can speak with him personally uh, at that time. Uh, and so we are delighted this afternoon to be able to welcome back among us Father James. It's an honor to have uh, you all come out this, this evening to be with uh, me here, and I hope that uh, in what I say that I will not disappoint you. Let's pray before we begin. Our Heavenly Father, as we learn more about uh, your church, we pray that for those of us have, who have had fears about church, that we would come to know the love, your love, that abides in the church and uh, will grow to a closeness uh, to embrace you within the church. And we pray, Lord, for those of us who are confused by the multitudes of churches, that you will provide us clarity to know whether a church is uh, truer than any other, and if so, how. And in all of this, uh, that we might somehow be drawn closer to you and uh, to one another in Christian love. We pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You all were told a little bit of my history, but I know that there are a number of you who were not here yesterday, and so I'll compliment it a little bit so that you know a little bit more about me before we uh, delve into what uh, is the church. My father uh, was born in the old city of Jerusalem, and he was actually raised to be a Hasidic, a Orthodox Jewish rabbi, and uh, did receive his rabbinical certificate from the chief uh, rabbi of the Ashkenazi community of Jerusalem, at that time Palestine, uh, Chaim Joseph uh, Sonnenfeld, who is a uh, sage among uh, Orthodox Jewish rabbis. And so uh, the four uh, grandparents lived in, in the Holy Land, and actually the four grandparents were buried on the Mount of uh, Olives. Uh, my father always liked to remind me that uh, his side were buried t closer to the top, and my mother's side closer to the bottom. <laughs> and uh, so I was uh, born in uh, Michigan, but raised in New York City, and I'm really a New York City boy, and uh, <clears throat> had a dramatic conversion experience when I was 16 years of age, uh, a, what would, one would call a born-again uh, experience. And uh, at that time, uh, it, it really uh, alienated me from my, uh, my family, from my relatives, and uh, you know the scripture that we read in, uh, in the gospel where our Lord Jesus says, uh, he who loves father and mother uh, more than me is not worthy of me. Uh, he who uh, loves uh, uh, brother or sister more than me is not worthy them of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And uh, that really did strike home uh, for me because uh, for me to become a, a disciple of Christ meant really making a choice between uh, my family, my nuclear family, my extended family, my uncles, my cousins, uh, and the history, really. And uh, so in, in so choosing, I, I did lose uh, my, my family, especially uh, the, those who were religious Jews and um, uh, but have adopted a new family, which is uh, the family uh, that I have uh, within the church. So I'm thankful for the mercies of God, and 
And so what happened subsequently is uh, after converting, I became um, involved uh, in the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship on, at Queens College campus in New York City, and then moved to uh, the San Francisco Bay Area in 1970 with uh, Moisha Rosen to establish uh, a brand new ministry called Jews for Jesus, and uh, lived in Berkeley, and um, I was one of the founding uh, members of that uh, organization, became uh, involved with what was called the Jesus Movement on the West Coast with a group called Christian World Liberation Front, which was an out, out, uh, offshoot of uh, Campus Crusade for Christ, and uh, had street ministries, lived in Christian communes, uh, established ho house churches, and then uh, meandered uh, uh, towards Orthodox Christianity as I became uh, disillusioned with much of uh, the Protestant evangelical experience that I had and uh, was looking for something uh, that had roots uh, and that was uh, historical, that uh, was more uh, akin to the Judaism uh, that, with which I was raised. And so today my talk is on finding and discovering the original church. And uh, talking uh, about the church is no easy task for me because as a convert from Judaism to Christianity at 16 years of age, I was drawn, drawn to Jesus, but absolutely did not like church. And this was because of the, in part because of the dismal relationship between the institutional churches and the Jews throughout the century. It is a history written in blood. And because of this, I became what I would call a romophobic, Ro romophobic because of uh, all churches, the Roman Catholic Church in particular, had the worst record in its treatment of Jews. And this meant that I tended, as most Jewish converts to Christianity do, to, to pick and choose. To pick and choose what I would believe and to where I would fellowship. No, not go to church, but to, to fellowship and to worship. Sort of like uh, shopping at a uh, spiritual uh, supermarket. And so my commitment was to not be committed. <laughs> to any church. In fact, I had a friend who wrote a book called uh, uh, The Bible Versus the Churches. And which did you think that he felt was true? The Bible. The Bible versus the churches. So the truth is, it took me 16 years to discover Jesus and 19 years to discover his church. It took me longer to discover his church than it did to discover him. This phenomena is typical among Jews who come to believe in Christ. And one option for a Jewish convert is to be involved in what are called Messianic Jewish fellowships. That is, churches that mingle Christian and Jewish practices. And as a founding member of Jews for Jesus in 1970, I know about both Hebrew Christian fellowships and Messianic Jewish fellowships. In visiting Messianic Jewish fellowships, um, many of my visits would run like this. I would meet someone who, knowing of my Jewish heritage, would say, isn't it wonderful 
to have the best of both worlds, Christian and Jewish. And I would say, yes, it's interesting. <laughs> and then as we would talk further, they would ask me what my name is, and I would say Arnold Bernstein. And I would ask, well, what is your name? And uh, they would very often say something like, Patrick McDonald, or Tony Angelo. And I would say, well, that doesn't sound very Jewish, does it? And the response would be typically, I am spiritually Jewish. I have been grafted in. And then I would say, to myself, where were all these Jewish wannabes during World War II when no one wanted to be a Jew? So I discovered that these fellowships consist mostly of Gentiles who had deep, deep-seated resentments against established traditional churches and were enamored by things Jewish. So, these Gentile Christians, they were in the same boat that I was, dissatisfied with the traditional church and making it up as they go along, sort of reinventing the church. We all were reluctant to accept that the Holy Spirit has guided the Gentiles' church's worship and that the present church of the Gentiles, which also includes a small number of Jewish believers, is the church. The wonder of Orthodox Christianity, my friends, is that it has not only enabled me to find the original church, but at the same time, rediscover the Jewish roots of worship. And much of this presentation will be to explain how. Orthodox worship emphasizes the worship of the one God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. As a young man, I had often prayed what is called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, which is in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Shema Yitzrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. And also, as a child, during the Jewish High Holy Days morning services, we would recite a prayer with over 40 petitions, each beginning with our Father, our King, in Hebrew, Avenu Malchenu. These prayers emphasized that God is one, and that He is our Father, our Creator, and King. In contrast, often my worship experience as a Protestant focused almost solely upon the worship of Jesus. And in fact, there is even a Jesus-only church sect. And often I viewed Christ as sort of a cosmic buddy. And the casual worship I knew reinforced this understanding. As a born-again evangelical Protestant, I deeply miss the worship of God as the awesome creator of the universe, who, though he could be known, was nevertheless mysterious and beyond understanding. That mystery was something that was so special, the sense of mystery. It was 
with great delight that I discovered that Orthodox Christians primarily direct their worship to God, the Father, which is how the earliest Christians worshiped, and that the Orthodox believe that there is one God because there is one Father. And this is why the Nicene Creed itself, which is the earliest full creed of the church, says, I believe in one God, the Father. Almighty creator of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life who proceeds from the Father. For the ancient New Testament writers and Jewish Christians, the one God was the person of the Father and not the divine nature that they share in common. The Nicene Creed says, I believe in one God, the Father, almighty creator, not I believe in one divine nature. Nature is not a person. Unfortunately, in later development in the Latin West among non-Orthodox churches, it came to be held that it is the one common, shared divine nature that makes the three persons God. Thus, in this understanding, God the Father is no longer the source of unity in the Trinity. This is the prevailing view held within both the Roman Catholic Church and Protestantism. It is neither biblical nor orthodox and is not what the Orthodox Church believed. In the original ancient church, the person of the Father makes the three persons divine and worthy of worship. And this is what the Orthodox Church continues to teach. In addition to the Orthodox Church retaining the proper understanding of who we worship, which of course is fundamental to worship, we worship the one true God. She also retains the original form of worship. The form of early church worship. For sure, there was change in the forms and understandings of the first century apostolic church during the first five centuries as she grew and developed. And many of us who, were, who are, are Protest, were Protestants or are Protestants view this transition as the result of a deterioration and paganization of life and worship of the official church in order to accommodate the nominalism of the masses that had flooded into the church. The orthodox view is that the transition was desirable and in fact a necessary aspect in the inclusion of the Gentiles into the church and there was a movement of the Holy Spirit. The more one studies ancient church worship, the more one discovers how distant and disconnected much of present-day Christian worship is. So how did the, the first Jewish Christians worship? Many assume that the earliest Christians worshiped without liturgy, structure, or read prayers, and that the worship was fellowship and evangelistic-centered and not at all Eucharistic not communion-centered. But the reality is, is the New Testament Christians were Jews 
who continue to worship liturgically in the synagogues and in the temple, just as the Jews who did not follow Christ. The New Testament says in the Gospel of Luke 4, 16 of Jesus, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. It was his normal practice. In John 18, 20, our Lord Jesus said, I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always met, where the Jews always meet. And for how long? Until the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman legions in 70 AD, and the synagogues for as long as they were permitted to do so. That is, until they were forbidden to do so and were forcefully excluded by those Jews that did not accept Jesus as the Messiah. The point is, the early Jewish Christians did not voluntarily cease worshiping in the synagogue because they disliked the style of worship or thought that it was dead or unspiritual or for, thought that it was too formal or too structured, too ornate, too ceremonial and too liturgical or too much like pagan worship. For them, synagogue worship was the true form of worship that needed simply to be completed or made full. They did not want to replace the synagogue worship with a different form of worship. They simply wanted to take what was there and add to it, to fulfill it, to complete it. The early Christians did not discard synagogue and temple worship as worthless and instead develop a totally new, spontaneous, free-form worship. Rather, many elements of both temple and synagogue worship were retained as well as of the Passover meal. We also must keep in mind that of the Gentiles who entered the expanding church, many were called God-fearers and were very familiar with Judaism and her worship and practices throughout the Roman Empire. And the fact is that the early Christians didn't simply go to the Jerusalem temple and their synagogues only to witness, which is really, you know, what I did for many years believe, that the only reason they would have gone to such forms of worship that were dead was in order to witness and bring those Jews there who worshiped a formal form of religion that was lifeless into some new form of spontaneous way of worship. This is not true. They didn't go only to witness. No doubt they did witness, but they went also to worship because for them that was the authentic God-blessed form or way to worship. And that means that there is form and there is structure to worship. It is a Christian belief that Christ came to fulfill the law and temple worship by being the ultimate sacrifice of which the temple sacrifices were a type and prefigurement. And yet, the purpose of temple worship was not only to point us to the prototype Lamb of God, Christ. There is another reason for God having given temple worship to his people that has been forgotten by a large number of Christians. And it is this that I really want to focus. Biblical temple worship shows us in some 
form in some way as a glimpse on earth what worship is like in heaven. Unfortunately, the non-Orthodox Christians increasingly only acknowledge the prophetic aspect of temple worship as it points to the Lamb of God, the sacrifice, Jesus, and ignore the revelatory aspect of temple worship as pertains to how we are to worship. Many Christians forget that Moses was told to make a copy of the original pattern of worship he was shown in heaven. If you recall, that was done on Mount Sinai. And we are given many glimpses in the Bible itself of heavenly worship, that is, of the prototype, model, and origin of, all, of the earthly temple worship revealed to man by God. The Orthodox Church teaches that worship has been revealed to us, and its revealing has been progressive, has deepened, and there is a language and structure to worship. So as we consider worship in heaven on earth, what do we discover? This. Let us content, consider first some spiritual references to heavenly worship. In Exodus chapter 24 and 25, God is recorded as saying to Moses, quote, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show you. That is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of its functioning just so you shall make it. This presents a spiritual reality that is beyond our full ability to comprehend or describe. Nevertheless, it does present us with a reality. There are many passages of scripture in both the Old and New Testaments that give us a glimpse of what the worship of God in heaven is like. Isaiah 6, 1 to 4, the prophet Isaiah had a vision in which he sees things that are difficult to describe. The Apostle John describes in the book of Revelation as best he can, worship in heaven, Revelation chapter 4. Whenever the scriptures speak of worship in heaven, the scene is glorious, majestic, with a great deal of order. There is great beauty incorporated into the worship. The worship is not at all casual. In fact, the elders worshiping fall down before God in awe. And this is not a cosmic buddy Jesus being worshiped, but rather the incarnate God, the King of glory and creator of the universe, the worship is awesome. Hebrew chapter 8 says, now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. There are priests on earth who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he, God, said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. In 1991, my wife and some of my children had opportunity to visit Mount Sinai in Egypt as St. Catherine Monastery, which is the Orthodox Christian monastery at the base of uh, Mount Sinai, is, uh, is that uh, the site of which is believed to be a descendant of the, uh, the original burning bush. And so many Christians from throughout the world visit uh, the site there at the base of Mount Sinai uh, to see where Moses and the people people of Israel uh, congregated to receive the Ten Commandments, 
and to see the descendant of the original burning bush. And uh, <clears throat> the bush, as I saw, and there is good reason to believe from those who have investigated this and studied it that it actually is uh, a descendant of the original bush, had a, a vine-like experience, appearance. The appearance was a vine hanging down, and as we appro approached, we saw, stood in awe. And I made a decision to step forward and uh, to touch uh, the bush. And for me, uh, to touch the burning bush is, uh, you can see, imagine, a, uh, a, a, a somewhat of an ecstatic experience. And so as I touched the bu bush, it, it, it pricked me. And I said, what is this? And I, I rudely discovered that the burning bush has thorns. And its scientific name is Rubus Sanctus. And as I closely examined the bush, I discovered that it is related to the blackberry, as I went online and studied it and wanted to know more about its history and how the first original uh, monastics uh, went to the site there because it was already known in the, in the third century and, and even before uh, the second century that it was a holy site and sought to preserve the bush. So the burning bush represents the light to which we all are called to be consumed by the fire of God's love, but not destroyed. And this life is not smooth or easy, but really most thorny. It's full of trials. The holy thorns on the holy bush remind us of the sacred and holy cross that each of us bear. And that worship itself is a struggle. It's a struggle that takes effort and sacrifice. We don't come just to be fed. And I remember how often I would go to various churches when I was younger, and I would say, well, you know, the church was nice. I enjoyed it, but, uh, you know, I, I didn't feel, I didn't feel. I didn't feel fed. And it was all about feeling. But we come to give, not to receive. To give of ourselves, to give. To give to God all that we are and all that we have. And if we receive, Praise the Lord. And certainly God re gives to us abundantly. Now, there are some very obvious aspects with regard to worship that some might think are not necessary to mention. The sad fact, though, is that contemporary forms of Christian worship are so far distanced from the biblical forms that I am compelled to mention the obvious. For instance, the sacredness of holy space or sacred area. You have a sense being here in this sanctuary of a certain san sanctity, a certain sacredness. Exodus chapter 25 through 27 and other scriptures provide a detailed description of temple worship. And the site of worship was more than an auditorium or place to meet, hear lectures, or worse, to be entertained. The area was considered to be sacred. We, as Americans, often have a hard time appreciating the sacred. Sacredness has fallen on, on hard times, my, my friends. 
It hasn't only been the secularist and materialist and hedonist of our time that have brought this about. Many Christians that pride themselves on being non-liturgical, non-sacramental, non-hierarchical, and are contemptuous of sacred objects, relics, and sites have contributed to the loss of a sense of sacredness in our American culture. That is, this comes from those who are religious as well as those who are, are secular. And it is no wonder that we are now at a point to where it is common to hear that nothing is sacred anymore. Continuing, when the Ark of the Covenant was brought into the temple, the scripture says, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the, the house of God in 2 Chronicles chapter 5. And this was the Shekinah glory of God. His presence was manifest as holy smoke, of which holy incense of the temple and ancient church serve as a reminder. Likewise, in the ancient church and continuing in the Orthodox Church, the church building is called a temple. It is so called because since ancient times, the church temple was divided into distinct sections that by st stages are designed to bring one step by step by step deeper into the holy temple. So we have the narthex, the vestibule the nave, which is this area, the holy place, and the holies of holies. Beyond the nave to the east was the sanctuary that had prominently and centrally placed an altar. And this was so because the altar was the focus during the ancient Christian worship, not the pulpit, as is often the case in most, many churches today. The altar was the focus, not the pul pulpit. And if we consider the archaeological stone remains that exist throughout the Holy Land in that area of the world, the earliest churches found that are, remain the, st the rockery have as the central focus the altar in never the pulpit. Every place is holy because God is present everywhere, even in the dungeon, even in hell. As the psalmist says, if I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. Psalm 139, 8. Though it is true that God is accessible wherever we are, the scriptures and church also teach that some places especially encourage and inspire the realization of God's presence and accessibility. That is, we need to be inspired because we are weak and struggle to gain faith. The holy space is for our benefit not for God's. And within the holy space, as we see here in the sanctuary, is holy beauty or sacred art. One of the Ten Commandments says, Thou shalt have no graven images, Exodus 24. And yet, God himself instructed his people to make images. The image itself is not evil. In Exodus 25, 22, God has Israel construct two golden images of cherubim that overlook the Ark of the Covenant. If that's not an image, then what is? In Exodus 26, 1, the woven curtains that separate the holies of holies from the holy place 
that the Gospels say was rent from top to bottom had images of cherubim woven into them. First Kings chapter 6 describes the interior of Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. And verse 18 states that the interior of the temple was made with cedar wood, quote, carved with ornamental buds and open flowers. And verse 29 says, he carved all, all the walls of the temple, all around, both the inner and outer sanctuaries, with carved figures of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. These images were also carved on the doors of the sanctuary. In some regards, it's fair to say that the walls looked like the orthodox iconostasis or the, the icon wall because the images were everywhere. Chapter 7, verse 18 says that two columns were built at the entrance of the temple having rows of pomegranate images at the top of the capitals. And the capitals were in the shape of lilies. Continuing in the same chapter, 1 Kings chapter 7, the scripture says that God instructed his people to build a huge laver or pool of water outside the entrance of the temple that was held up by 12 massive statues of oxen. The pool of water was set on their backs, and these were not pictures of oxen, but actual huge statues. Also, ten carts of bronze used for cleansing purposes were built with images of lions and oxen and cherubim engraved upon them. Thus, we see images were used extensively in the temple and tabernacle. And in fact, even present-day synagogues often have images of lines of the tribe of Judah. Subsequently, the early Christians made extensive use of images in their worship, as is shown in the most earliest of churches discovered, as, for instance, the synagogue church of Dura Europa, in which we have discovered extensive icons on, on large iconostasis like wall, and you see images of uh, biblical scenes throughout. It's the earliest, perhaps the earliest synagogue church ever discovered. Many of the earliest churches have ornate stone pictorial mosaics, especially those uncovered in the Holy Land. And the underground burial sites in the catacombs in Rome also have extensive use of imagery, especially of biblical scenes painted over and around the niches where the body of the martyred saints were laid in secret at a time in which Christianity was illegal in the Roman Empire. God also instructed his people to build an altar of incense Incense was used extensively in Jewish worship as it represented both the prayers of his people ascending to God and the sweetness of God's holy presence, his Shekinah glory. Ma Malachi 1.11 says, and this is a, uh, a most interesting scripture, for from the rising of the sun even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles, in every place incense shall be offered to my name. And this prophecy is fulfilled daily in Orthodox Christian worship services, that incense shall be offered to my name. Candles were used not only for the utilitarian purpose of casting light, but also because the light represented the light of the Holy Spirit of God. And this continues to be the practice of Jews, that they continued the ancient practice, even within their own religion, as they celebrate Hanukkah and pray for the departed using candles, as I recall my mother. 
may God bless her, her, her memory, uh, used and bought candles in order to pray for the departed ones, her loved ones, uh, and her family. The Orthodox Church continues to use olive oil and beeswax candles and has a seven-branch candelabrum upon or immediately behind the altar, which is behind me. So now, in addition, there's the sacredness of holy ritual and ceremony and liturgics within the form of worship that God revealed to the Jews in temple worship. And that was also incorporated into synagogue worship was sacred movement, liturgical action. And I recall as a young man going to the synagogue how often the procession with the Torah took place in which uh, as the Torah was processed uh, through the congregation, we would have the opportunity with our prayer shawls, atala, talit, to, to kiss the Torah, to touch it. And this reminds me so vividly of the Orthodox Christian procession with the Holy Gospel. And not only with the Gospel, but with the Eucharistic bread and wine, with icons and relics and candles and crosses and banners. As a child, I remember how clearly the cantors in the synagogue can't chant. And they didn't read. They mostly chanted. And similarly, in the Orthodox Christian worship, we chant hymnody, psalms, and scripture. And for us, the psalms are the prayer book of the church, just as it is in Judaism. Sacred reading typically are chanted, and additional practices that show the Orthodox Christian rootedness in the original church and synagogue worship include the use of written prayers. The lexicon, the annual cycle of scriptural readings, the cycle of feast days and fast days, the hours and special times of prayer that help us develop discipline, the rules of personal and private prayer in the morning and evening, the kissing of holy objects, the kissing, the sacred act, to kiss. I remember as a child, how often we kissed. We kissed the Torah. We, we kissed the scriptures. We kissed the mezuzah on the doorway wall. We kissed everything. And I remember, you know, even dropping a Bible as a kid and how that my mother would say to me, pick it up and kiss it. Why? Because the scriptures were sacred sacred. And that's why, as the Orthodox Christian, we don't put the hymnal on the floor. We don't put the Holy Scriptures on the floor, not because we worship that, but because they are sacred. We kiss one another on the cheek as we greet one another. And this is a very common way in which Orthodox Christians greet. And they kiss on one cheek and then the other cheek and also shake hands as well. But I remember in my family as a youth being raised and kissed for a kid whose uncles loved smoking cigars as at least two of my uncles did, Max and Morris. This could be totally disgusting. <laughs> Especially if your uncle's huge, and he did have huge, nicotine-covered lips missed kissing your cheeks and instead slimes your mouth. And I remember saying to my mom, do I have to see him? I don't. 
I didn't want to. And so, you know, somehow kissing is a religious as act in which we show uh, respect to, just as if I am not with my family and I have a picture of my wife with me and I see her picture and out of love and devotion to her, I kiss it. I kiss it not because I, I worship it or because uh, I am worshiping her, although she may think sometimes I am, but because I love her. And so we kiss the icons because we respect them, because we venerate them. I have a, an amusing story with regard to kissing. <clears throat> I'm going to re relate this story. Uh, our Bishop uh, Joseph, at one time on the West Coast, as I live in uh, Seattle, uh, visited uh, a nearby Protestant church, Grace Community Church, that had recently become Orthodox and uh, changed its name to St. Andrew Orthodox Church. And it was the first time uh, that the altar servers served with the bishop as they were new Orthodox Christians and they had really very little idea of what they were doing. For them, to be very blunt, it was terrifying. And uh, at the conclusion of the service, the bishop had to be divested of his vestment. It means the vestment had to be taken off. And uh, it had many buttons on it. And so looking at the middle-aged man who was a new convert to orthodoxy and was scared stiff, at serving, the bishop said to him kindly, in a kindly manner, pointing to his buttons on his vestment and saying, the button, the buttons. And expecting the altar server to assist the unbuttoning of the long row of buttons on his huge vestment, and so the poor fellow looks at me and then at the bishop and then at the buttons and not knowing what to do, he begins kissing the buttons. He begins kissing the button, and well, the bishop jumps back, startled, and says, no, don't kiss the buttons, unbutton the buttons. <laughs> so, actually, in some way, the acolyte altar service had it right. In orthodoxy, when you don't know what to do, you kiss. <laughs> Because, because we kiss what we love. So he loved the button. <laughs> so in addition to there being in the original church sacred space and area and sacred beauty and art and sacred ritual and ceremony, there is also sacred time. Sacred time. God is accessible to us at any time. No issue there any time we have access to God. So some Christians say that no time is more sacred than any other time. That is that one day is as good as another. And therefore, they say that within the church there is no need to observe traditional Christian holy days and special feasts and fasts. And by the way, I want to caution those who may feel that way not to tell their spouses and children because one day is good as another. Let's drop remembering and commemorating birthdays, wedding anniversaries, the 4th of July, Memorial Day and Thanksgiving Day, not a good idea. We need to be reminded that the ancient Christian practice of observing special days and times for worship and prayer was done not so much because a specific time or day inherently had a special sacredness to it, rather the purpose of setting aside special days and times of the days for specific prayers was in order to bring order and discipline to the chaos of the believer's life. The purpose was therapeutic and salvific. Some Christians hold that observing certain days as sacred is not only unnecessary, but even detrimental. And I've heard it argued even evil. 
they refer <clears throat> to such scriptures as Galatians where St. Paul says you observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain, Galatians 4. What St. Paul is cautioning the Galatians against is not to permit themselves to become legalistic, to be circumcised, and seek to become Jews. It had nothing to do with forbidding the setting aside of holy days, but rather the resisting of the Judaizers who were pressing the Gentiles, the Gentile Christian, to observe the Old Testament Jewish laws and circumcision. In fact, the early church had to decide which holy days to continue to observe and in what form. The church of the first four centuries celebrated very many diverse holy days throughout the year. There was a strong sense of continuity with worship as described in the scriptures. I was uh, disappointed in looking in the New Testament and trying to find a form and detailed description of how to worship because it really is not there. In terms of the earliest church, there is no description of a, of a, of a worship service in the New Testament. But thankfully, Many writings from the first four century contain detailed descriptions of its services. There existed a uniform form that was consistent from one church to another across the Christian world. Of what did this worship consist? My first discovery was that the worship services were universally centered upon weekly Sunday Holy Communion that is, Eucharist, thanksgiving, with the sermon serving a secondary supportive role. Worship in the original church was liturgical and sacramental. The fact that worship was highly liturgical, sacramental, and hierarchical was difficult for me to accept. That is not at all the kind of worship that I wanted to find in the original church. It was not what I wanted. As a born-again Christian, I had grown accustomed to easygoing, folksy, spontaneous, warm, visitor-friendly worship services. Being Romophobic, I was fearful and even hostile to traditional high church worship. On the other hand, I was conflicted because Jewish worship was, and it has always been, even in the scriptures, highly liturgical. And many Jewish believers that I knew were desirous to incorporate litur liturgical practices into their worship experience, so long as they were not from the historic church, but were from the synagogue only. So I began to read writings readily available that are clearly showed that the universal practice of the church throughout the Roman Empire was totally, totally liturgical and included the elements I have presented. And these writings include, and I'm giving a brief, short list, that are readily available. You can go online to access them the letters of St. Ignatius of Antioch, first century, Justin Martyr of Rome, second century, whose first apology written to the Emperor Marcus Aurelius explains Christianity, describes its worship, and in particular, the Eucharist. St. Clement of Alexandria, second century, describes what the Eucharist is. Hippolytus of Rome, third century, in the apostolic tradition, provides a detailed description of how the church in Rome worshiped it. Saint Cyril of Jerusalem, fourth century, in his catechetical lectures, tells how to prepare for communion and describes the service. Egeria, fourth century, in her diary of a pilgrimage, describes in great detail, it's one of my favorite descriptions, 
worship services as she personally witnessed in Jerusalem and at Mount Sinai, and that's in the 300s. St. Ambrose of Milan, 4th century, in his On the Sacraments, speaks about the Eucharist. In addition, I study the extensive writings and sermons of St. John Chrysostom, 4th century, August, St. Augustine, 5th century, as well as many others, and I found every, every account given of worship from that area are all in agreement, without exception, without exception, as to how Christians worship. From the Holy Land to, to Greece, from Greece to Rome, to, to Egypt and Syria and Gaul and Britain, throughout the empire, the Christians worked, worshiped essentially the same way. Now, early on in my Christian life as a fundamentalist, I would have said, well, that the records were all falsified at a later time by the Roman Catholic Church. You know, historically, there's no way that that can be proven. Or I would have held that before the, after rather, the apostles died, the entire Christian church went into apostasy all at once, everywhere, which is also equally ridiculous. But I believed it because the alternative to believing that was too hard to bear. The implications were too difficult for me to receive. Discovering Christian roots. Deeply impressed with ancient Orthodox Christian worship, I began to seriously consider the continuity of the present-day Orthodox Church with the early church. As a Jew, having roots had always been important to me. And now I contemplated the importance of having Christian roots as, all, as well. The evangelical Gentile Christians who told me I am Jewish too, thought of themselves as spiritual Jews, but somehow in their confusion, also thought of themselves as physical Jews. Many have a similar view of the church. They tend to spiritualize everything often at the cost of the physical. Some will not identif identify themselves with any specific historic church, yet consider themselves to be somehow in the church. It is not important to them to have historical continuity with the ancient church. In contrast to this, I came to believe that the church is every bit as physical and historical as the Jewish people. As an authentic Jew, I desired with all my heart to be a Christian in an authentic Christian church, one that was physically locatable throughout the centuries. I believe that my evangelical Protestant brethren were authentic Christians who knew Jesus, and I knew them to know Jesus. And they lived holy lives, and they were, I believe, heaven-bound. And in fact, in my estimation, many of my Protestant and Catholic brethren lived holier lives than I, both then and now. But I was sure of one thing. I didn't want to believe, be in a make-believe church. I wanted to be in that church which is historically connected with the ancient Jewish Christian body of believers. And in this effort, I came to recognize that the present-day Orthodox Church has clearly identifiable roots. She has a historical continuity of doctrine which can be traced back to the apostles and this deposit of truth called apostolic tradition or holy tradition 
was held to have been passed down faithfully from person to person and from generation to generation. Orthodox lineage was undeniably visible, discernible, and historical. The church claimed to be, as the Apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy 3.15, the pillar and ground of the truth. The Church of the Holy Land, and this is what I'm going to conclude with, as it's uh, somehow my favorite uh, subject, the Church of the Holy Land. I recall following the Six Day War in uh, June 1967, I happened to be in uh, the Holy Land, living on the border of uh, Jerusalem and uh, Bethlehem during that time, being naive, uh, not aware that there really was going to be a war, sort of got stuck on the border uh, during uh, the war. Uh, my, my dad had sent me to uh, Israel uh, for a year uh, while I was in college in the hope that I would reconvert to uh, Judaism. And so there I was, and I had met, you know, my grandmother, the own, my only living grandmother and uh, some of my relatives and co cousin, some which did not, could not speak a word of English. And uh, <clears throat> so I lived uh, in the, uh, uh, there, and then following the, uh, the war, I was among the first to move into the old city of Jerusalem from the new city. Uh, again, that's a very naive uh, act of mine. And I lived with Arab, uh, Protestant Christian close to where my father was born. Now, I didn't know exactly where he was, but it could have been, for all I know, in the same house. So during my few months stay there, I had many opportunities to visit the holy sites and churches in Jerusalem. And the Protestant side of me had difficulty appreciating the more ornate and traditional churches. I would tend to, you know, visit the garden tomb. And, uh, but as I met uh, Jerusalem Christians, I realized that the indigenous Arab Christians, the indigenous Arab Christians in the Holy Land are neither Protestant nor Roman Catholic. They are Orthodox Christian. Acts 1.8 says that prior to his ascension, the Lord Jesus told the apostles, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The fact that the Orthodox Church is the indigenous church in the Middle East and in the Holy Land, the land of the Bible, and of our ancient Jewish forefathers did not seem accidental to me. The Orthodox Church existed for a millennium and a half before Protestantism was born. From this Jerusalem birthplace, Orthodox Christianity spread west to Rome and Greece, north to Europe and to Russia, south to Egypt and east to Persia and India. As I recall my Holy Land experience, I cannot help but think that there is a providential purpose in the continuous presence of Orthodox Christianity in the Holy Land, just as there is for the continued existence of the Jewish people. The Orthodox Church is more than a mystical body of believers. She is also an institutional, concrete, and historical reality with clearly recognizable expansion. As the indigenous church in the Holy Land, the Orthodox Church can be traced back to the very beginning, to Christ himself and to the apostles. This physical historical continuity rooted in the Holy Land was very meaningful to me as a Jewish Christian and continues to be. And this physical continuity in worship, doctrine, practice, morality, apostolic succession enables me to experience 
that very same Orthodox Church today. And that, for me, is the, the single greatest blessing of my life. Thank you very much. I want to thank my brother, the Archpriest Father James. Uh, today, after a few minutes, he will be going back to his home. But uh, I cannot help but to share with you something very special that in 1996, His Eminence Metropolitan Philip sent a delegation to the Holy Land and being born in Jerusalem, Palestinian Arab Christian, ninth generation priest. I have met Father James and we were on the same committee to go and visit the Arab Christians in Jerusalem and he began to tell me the story and I'm always compassionate and difficult for me to understand uh, when the scriptures Jesus said if you love father and mother more than me you are not worthy of me and as we walked in Jerusalem outside the city gate he said you know my grandfather is buried there and I said, my grandfather is buried in the Christian section. There's Jewish se section and Christian section, Muslim section. And I said, uh, do you have families here? Let's visit. He said, I do, but I am separated. They separated from me. You know, as born, cradle born, Orthodox Christian, I will never comprehend the sacrifices priests and lay people when they leave their churches and embrace the faith. They sacrifice a lot, a lot. And I've seen priests who are here who have embraced from the various Protestant world because they have discovered the truth from being serving the pulpit to be serving just tables and restaurants. That's a big sacrifice. And I really appreciate that so much. And I want to thank you for listening to the Father as well as hopefully you can listen to Matthew Gallatin this evening. I want to thank His Eminence Metropolitan Philip and the Department of Mission and Evangelism uh, to have chosen Oklahoma for the spirit of the Orthodox Brotherhood in the state and the cooperation to share in this best secret in America and now is no longer a secret everybody discovering the church through the internet so please whatever light you have received today don't keep it to yourself share it with others enlightening others maybe you will have somebody who does not have a home we are not trying to take people out of their churches we want to pray for the pastors and ministers in this town but people who have no home, we say, welcome home. They can come home to their forefathers. So I thank you very much. Please fill the survey, pass them, or give them to the ushers. We have a fellowship and book signing. May God bless you. Thank you.